Now, this immediately struck me as FUD. So I want to talk about this because this is not the job of the Linux Foundation. And it's clear they've far exceeded their scope and mission. So this tweet that was uh, posted three hours ago as I record this says, Watch these 12 research highlights from our latest report. The carbon footprint of NFTs. Not all blockchains are created equal. And it is a video that proceeds to spread a bunch of environmentalism FUD about free software projects. And it's horrendous. So I'm going to play a little bit of it for you, and we'll talk about this. And then I'll explain why I called them out and why I think they're absolutely wrong. Games are created equal. Authored by Alan Major with a foreword by Daniela Barbosa. Produced by Linux Foundation Research in partnership with Hyperledger Foundation and Palm NFT Studio. NFTs are tokenized versions of physical or virtual assets. NFTs are central to new business models and new economies. I don't necessarily agree with that assertion. Um, I think if NFTs were to transition into more of a utility token, you know, an NFT is a ticket to a concert or it's a ticket to a meetup. Um, an NFT is a badge that, uh, you know, like an unlocked badge, an achievement unlocked. Uh, here's an example of an NFT that sounded kind of interesting to me. I was recently offered an NFT to, I guess, prove that I was an original Mt. Gox customer who had his Bitcoin hacked. And so if you provide certain identifiable information to the folks that are still in charge of this whole Mt. Gox situation, they'll mint you a dedicated NFT that like, is like a certification that you were one of the OGs. I, I, I didn't go through for I just don't care enough about NFTs, but I, so I didn't go through with it. I, I, to me, the value is not here yet. Having something that can demonstrate you prove ownership of a digital item seems like something we could use in the future. But to argue that they are some new form of a, economy, A, I think is a little bit of a false premise. I think it's overselling them. I don't think they've proved that point yet. I'd be willing to be convinced, but I don't think they've proven that point. Not all NFTs are equally carbon intensive. Now here they kind of imply that there is a direct equivalent to the NFT creation to power usage, as if the blockchain that's being used uses more power depending on how many NFTs are being created, which is not the case. The proof of work consensus mechanism and its underlying mining process requires intensive energy inputs. Proof of work is converting electricity into a digital asset. How that's being done determines how clean it is. It's not the process of mining that is dirty. It is how the power is generated. If you fix the power, you fix the mining. This is the same problem we have for charging your Tesla. It's the same problem we have when you run your air conditioner. It's the same problem we have when you run your clothes dryer. They're either dirty or they're clean depending on the source. The technology mechanism of the mining isn't dirty or clean. It's, a, it's neutral. It's a technology mechanism. Now, and I, as I linked in this tweet thread, there are numerous examples right now, specifically in the United States, about how Bitcoin mining is being used to capture off-gassed methane that would have just gone into the atmosphere and, in, and generate incentivizable renewable demand to make renewables like wind and solar actually profitable in places like Texas. And approximately 80% of NFTs are transacted via Ethereum, which uses proof of work, but is transitioning to proof of stake. Now, the other thing that doesn't work here is it's not just the mining process that secures the network. There's also nodes. Nodes are an active part of the decentralization of Ethereum and of Bitcoin. Ethereum has a lot less nodes, and Ethereum's nodes typically are running on AWS, a footprint that would exist regardless of Ethereum's existence. If Ethereum did proof of stake, or proof of work, AWS uses the same amount of power. Proof of stake is a system where people who are already rich can invest their wealth, like in the case of Ethereum, I think it's something like 25 or 35 Ethereum, which is tens and tens of thousands of dollars. They can stake that on the network, and as part of that, they get to operate in the decision-making process for the network. It is literally the rich staying rich, and they don't have to do anything to maintain that status. Because once they've accumulated that money and they stake it, they make an interest back on it, essentially. And so the powerful remain in power with a proof of stake system. Additionally, because the way the crypto market is organized, the, the exchanges are incentivized to stake your coins for you. Coinbase now lets you put your Ethereum and put your Cordana on Coinbase's wallets and they'll stake it for you. Well, what is that doing? That is making Coinbase one of the singular largest Ethereum stakers, and they'll only get bigger. So proof of stake also leads to centralization of the consensus mechanism. 
So not only does it keep the rich richer, which is the existing system that we have today, but it actually will centralize the consensus mechanism and make it vulnerable long term to take over like the banking system is today. Proof of stake is not a direct replacement for proof of work. They solve two very different problems. Proof of work is converting energy into a digital verifiable asset. That means that in order to participate in that network, you just need to mine. And to maintain your participation, to maintain your decision-making capability, you must work. You must continue to keep your equipment working. You must provide jobs. You must create a business around this. You have to work to maintain that ability to participate in the network. You are actually producing something. But with proof of stake, you get rich once and you stake it. And then you get to participate in the decision-making process from henceforward. Unless you do something stupid, and then they slash your money and take it from you. That's, what, that's the difference between proof of work and proof of stake. But they don't bother getting into that because this is just a short promo video. Bitcoin and Ethereum both account for 0.36 of total human-generated carbon. Now, that's their number that they have sourced, but that is not a consensus number. And there is no consensus number on the individual uses of Ethereum or of Bitcoin. Because, again, I just mentioned you'd also have to measure AWS in there if you're looking at Ethereum. So not only is there no individual consensus on their individual power usage, which I will get, I'll come back to this, but there's absolutely no consensus on their combined power usage. The NFT ecosystem is evolving with other low carbon options available. Prudent policy is essential. To then, to then recommend, essentially what this is, is this is saying, let's squash proof of work, the Bitcoin mechanism via policy because they know they can't beat it on a technology level. So the Linux Foundation is calling for policy that attacks free software because Bitcoin is open source free software. This is the level the Linux Foundation has stooped to now. Now, let's talk about real power usage because this does matter and this is very, very hard to measure, but Cambridge has a task force that is working diligently to produce unbiased results and they disclose everything on here Came, University of Cambridge has a Bitcoin electricity consumption index. You can just Google Cambridge Bitcoin electricity consumption index. And on here, they will tell you their estimate, their absolute best estimate where Bitcoin stacks up to other industries. For example, Bitcoin in this ranking has a ranking of 145. In comparison to that, all the data centers that they can calculate have a ranking of 200. So that kind of puts it in perspective. All of your air conditioners combined, 2,199. So you're getting an idea of the scale, right? All of the cellular and data networks, 250. Creating paper, 586. Creating cement, 384. Again, Bitcoin, 145. That kind of puts it in perspective for you, right? And they're watching this. This is a hard thing for them to calculate. But they're watching this. And again, you have to take into account that in the last year, Bitcoin has made remarkable efforts to move to more renewable mining technologies. As they become actual companies, I think there's now 13 or 14 publicly traded Bitcoin mining companies, or it's getting to that point. They have stockholders. They have board members. They have to do this right. So they're working with individual power companies to help capture power that was just wasted, literally burned into the air before. It's remarkable. And it actually is giving these guys a, a path to build renewable power grids, to technologies and solutions while making money, right? Like that's, that's like the key piece we've always been missing 40 years of my entire life. I've been waiting for some sort of transition to a better power source, but we've never done it because there's just so much money in fossil fuels. But now the Bitcoin mining industry, to save their own hides, has come up with a very clever solution. They can provide stable one or zero power demand, right? They can turn it on. They can turn it off instantly. They can work with the power company to buy undersold power, and they can shut down when the grid has additional load that they need to pay for, that they need to cover. It's really working. It's really working. But let's get, let's zoom out a little bit because what the Linux Foundation is doing here 
is they're using Energy FUD to go after free software. Um, proof of work is a lobbying effort. There are industries behind proof of work simply because this centralization technology and this staking technology makes them money. And so there's, there's a real lobby behind this effort in D.C. And the Linux Foundation uh, has the Hyperledger project under its umbrella. And the Hyperledger project is their proof of work enterprise blockchain that is centralized, a commercialized blockchain. And so they are hiring opposition research to attack free software, and they're using Energy FUD to do it. That's what's happening right now. And here's the funny thing. This has been done over and over again. This is a Forbes article from 1999. I believe it was May 17th, 1999. You can Google this headline. Dig more coal. The PCs are coming. And this article throws every bit of energy FUD at the PC and the Internet possible, proclaiming it is going to destroy humanity and boil the oceans just like we do with Bitcoin right now. Of course, nobody mentions it for Tesla, and nobody, nobody mentions it for all the nice fancy things that people buy that take energy. No, no. Those of you that maybe have a fridge in your garage and a fridge in your kitchen, right? But psh, Bitcoin mining, psh, that's no good. So here we go. 1999, and I pulled out a few things that I think are just fantastic. They write, uh, the current fuel economy rating, about one pound of coal to create, package, and store and move two megabytes of data. You see how they've made this stupid equivalence like they're doing right now with the minting of an NFT or the single transaction of a Bitcoin, which don't have anything to do with the power consumption? Like the network uses the same power if you have a thousand transactions or one transaction. But here they're doing that same equivalency. When you move two megabytes of data, you are burning one pound of coal. This is what they said back in 1999. They go on to say the digital age turns out it's very energy intensive. The Internet may someday save us bricks, mortar and catalog paper, but it's burning up an awful lot of fossil fuel in the process. The bottom line, taken all together, chips are running hotter, faster and uh, whirling faster. And the power consumption of our disk drives and screens are rising. Of course, they couldn't see the development of SSDs and LCD monitors. About half a trillion dollar infrastructure today of electric power grid exists to serve just two century old technologies, the light bulb and the electric motor and the electric motors. And they make this, and there's a long, long, several paragraphs here where they try to make the case that the grid is only designed for the electric motor and the light bulb. And anything more complicated is going to destroy the grid. And you see, they say there are already 17,000 pure dot com companies like eBay, E-Trade, the larger ones each represent the electric load of a small village. That's exactly what they say about Bitcoin right now. You know, all of the mining together of Bitcoin is like, this, it's like the load of a small country. Even though they don't know, right? Nobody actually has real metrics. And then the author goes on to attack all of the networking gear required to make the internet work, like all the Cisco routers. And then, of course, they go to the tremendous waste of manufacturing computers to begin with, like we do with Bitcoin mining. They write, they write, just fabricating all these digital boxes requires a tremendous amount of electricity. The fabs and their suppliers currently consume 1% of the nation's electric output. Be very afraid. They continue, at least 100 million nodes on the internet, drawing from hundreds to thousands of kilowatts per hour, add up to 290 billion kilowatt hours of demand. That's about 8% of the total United States electrical demand. The global implications are enormous. One billion PCs on the web represents an electrical demand equal to total capacity of the U.S. today. That's right. If we get a billion PCs, which we are way beyond now, the total demand of all of these PCs will be the complete capacity of the United States. The grid will be completely maxed out. will be destroyed. And of course, there'll be fundamental change in another aspect of the power grid the author goes on. The quality and the reliability of the grid itself. The conventional grid tolerates power hiccups of a single cycle for 60 cycle power. With refrigerators and light bulbs and ovens, it's a blip. It's merely an inconvenience. But with computers and routers, 
It can be catastrophe. There you go. They end with a nice little stab at fans of the internet and PCs. Futurists have been promising an information highway. Not unit trains loaded with coal. Fiber optic cables, not 600 kilovolt power lines. Well, we're going to get both. That's what we were saying about the internet in 1999. And anybody who's a Linux user that's been around for a while knows that this is the same kind of crap Linux went through as well. The iPhone, mobile devices. Remember Steve Ballmer laughing at the iPhone? This is shameful from the Linux Foundation. And they asked me to read the report, and I did. And the report reads as a complete and total sales brochure for proof of stake, which is a system that makes the rich richer. And they're doing it at the cost of denigrating a free software project that is truly decentralized, that is truly creating opportunity for the people, that is the closest thing to Linux money has ever seen. Yeah, I read their report. And in my response, I linked them to the reports that indicate how Bitcoin mining can be used for renewable, including news reports, as well as an extensive white paper that Square put together. And this really gets into the technical details about how the inherent nature of the grid needs a high demand processor. It's really something. So go, this is one last thing to check. Square's Bitcoin is key to an abundant, clean energy future. They aim to explain how the Bitcoin network functions as a unique energy buyer that could enable society to deploy substantially more solar and wind generation capacity. I am all about that. So go check that out because that's really what's going on. And it's, it's just a shame that the Linux Foundation, just a shame. It, it really is sad to see him go this way. Mm-hmm. 